friends, um, I, I know that uh, I don't have to uh, introduce Trevor to you. He's been around before. Um, he's a friend of Grace Point. We feel like he's part of our family here uh, at Grace Point. We are so grateful um, for him being, being here today as he uh, speaks on healing. And um, I know that uh, we have been expectant of it and expecting that God is going to do incredible things today through our healing service. Uh, so can I please ask you to give Trevor a very, very warm Grace Point welcome. Good morning, <clears throat> good morning, friends. It's uh, good to be with you again, and I would like to start by reading a piece of scripture to you. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to James uh, chapter 5, and I'm reading from verses 13 to 16. And we're reading a, a passage of scripture that I think describes what uh, people in the early church kind of did uh, naturally uh, in their life together. So catch a glimpse. Here's, here is a glimpse of their life uh, as an early church community. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up, and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, uh, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Uh, when Adrian... Uh, said to me that today there was going to be a focus on praying uh, for healing, my own mind went back to the very, very first time I ever prayed for anyone else uh, for healing. I had just finished um, some studies at, at Rhodes University in my mid-twenties. Uh, you will know that's the best university in South Africa, and I'm just reminding you of that. Uh, and I had been sent to Boxburg uh, as a probationer minister. And it was in winter, June, July time, I got a phone call, it must have been about half past five in the morning from a lady that I didn't know and from a lady who was not part of our church and she just said to me on the phone, Trevor, I'm in a great deal of pain, I had an operation um, and the pain is excessive. Would you mind coming to pray for me? Now, when someone phones you in winter at half past five in the morning, your normal response is, have you asked your own minister to do this? Uh, and I asked her if she phoned her own minister, and she said, no, he doesn't believe in this kind of thing. I didn't want to say that I wasn't too sure either, but I had enough compassion, uh, I think, in my heart um, to respond to her desperation. And I, about an hour and a half later, about seven o'clock, I found my weight. She was in a complex. <clears throat> I had no idea what I was going to do. And uh, I arrived in the lounge. She had much more idea than I did because she had laid out a table. There was a Bible there. There was some oil. And uh, I knew this passage. And so I thought, I said to her, do you mind if I read a passage from Scripture? So she said, no, that's fine. So I read James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. I just read it to her. I asked her if she had anything that she wanted to confess. I thought the safest thing to do would be just to follow what James uh, suggests. So I asked her, do you have anything that you would like to, uh, to confess? And, and there were a few things that she shared and we offered them to God. And then we came to this time of anointing. Now, I had never seen anyone anoint anyone. I didn't know what to do. Do you pour it over the person? Do you, do you just put a little bit on it, 
on the face? Do you put it on the back where the pain is? I had no idea what to do next. So I somehow, not too sure how, I got what was in this little vial of oil. I got onto her face. It was streaming down her face. And I remember just praying for her and getting out of there as soon as I could, asking the Lord, Lord, I would appreciate it so much if I don't ever bump into Val again in my life. I got a call uh, early that evening, and it was Val. And she said, I just want to say thank you, Trevor, for coming around this morning. And... uh, I asked, well, how are you? And she said, well, it had been a much, much better day for her. And I was really surprised. And I was also grateful. And in that moment, and I can still remember it, I made a commitment to God. It was a very definite, conscious, deliberate commitment. And this commitment had two parts to it. I said to God, God, I want to learn as much as I can about the Christian ministry of healing. And so I enrolled again immediately at Rhodes, and this was my first bit of postgraduate study, and I did my honors um, in the ministry of Christian healing because I wanted to understand how this ministry had happened throughout the ages in the Christian church. And then I made another commitment. And I said, Lord, I I want to learn. I I want to learn. I want to learn how to be a conduit of your healing love to people. We live in a very, very broken world. Lord, I want to learn how to be a channel of your healing grace in the lives of other people. Will you please make me a sacrament of your healing presence? And it's been a journey now for many, many years, since 1978, and it's been a journey that's taken me into the depths of darkness, of the darkness of human pain, human suffering. It's also been a journey that's taken me uh, into the, uh, a deep celebration of God's healing love. And what God's healing love can do in the lives of ordinary people. And it's against this background um, this morning that I, I want to ask you today, all of you, I think all of us need healing. All of us. Every one of us. And my invitation this morning to each of you is to open your own life a little bit more widely to God's healing love. The God that we worship, and I want to speak very carefully here, the God that we worship, whose face we have seen in Jesus Christ, the God who has revealed God's self to us in Jesus Christ is a God who is on the side of healing and wholeness and restoration. Have you noticed, have you noticed this? that when you read the Gospels and you follow Jesus through the Gospels, he's either healing someone or he's come from healing someone or he's going to heal someone. Healing permeates the whole life of Jesus, the whole life of Jesus. Jesus reveals to us the God whose heart is always, always for healing. And I want that to be the bedrock of our worship of our worship this morning. God is on the side of healing and wholeness and restoration. That doesn't answer all the difficult, difficult questions that we do have. And we do have difficult questions. But I am wanting to suggest that in the midst of the mystery of, of human pain and suffering, that we take a stand on this rock. God is on the side of healing and wholeness and restoration. That's that's the deep conviction uh, of our faith as followers of Christ. So what I'm going to do, very, very simple. 
what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through that passage that I, that I read to you from James, and I'm, I'm literally going to take, take you through it just verse by verse. And I'm, as I do this, I'm doing this because I want to invite you to open your life a little bit more widely and deeply to God's healing love uh, today. And this passage helps us to do that. The first thing, and I want you to notice this, the passage will come up on scripture. Let me read that, the first part of verse 13 to you. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Now let's go to the next verse. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church. Now, let's just stop there. I'm going to ask Adrian just to leave that passage up there on the the screen for a while. Notice something. Notice that the responsibility there is on the person who desires God's healing love to ask. Let the person who is ill, let them call the elders of the church to come and be with them. And I want to suggest that this is very often the starting point of our experience of God's healing love. It's when we become vulnerable enough to ask for ministry. And it is, you you do feel vulnerable when you ask someone to minister to you. But that often is the start, it's the starting place for our experience of God's healing love. I don't know if there are any Baptists here um, this morning, but there was a great Baptist. His name was Spurgeon. And Spurgeon once said these words. He said, asking is the rule of the kingdom. Can I say it again? Asking is the rule of the kingdom. Asking opens our hands to receive. Asking gives God access into our life. God's not pushy. God's never, God will never gate crash our lives. God waits for consent. And the way we express our consent is we ask. We ask. Asking expresses the little bit of faith that we have. We don't need lots of faith. Jesus spoke about mustard seed faith. We just need a little little confidence that God is on the side of healing, that God is the source of healing. And, And my asking expresses that faith. It expresses that confidence that Jesus, that Jesus wants to step into my life with the Father's, with the Father's healing love. Vulnerably asking for ministry often is the beginning point for a very deep experience of God's healing love. And I realize that for some of us here today, it's very hard to do this. You know, during the week, we're pretty confident, we look important, we uh, have, you know, big jobs, we carry responsibility. And to actually humble ourselves To ask for ministry is sometimes very difficult, very difficult. I'll never forget a moment. This happened about, I would say about, uh, just over 20 years ago, I got a phone call from my own doctor. Um, And he said to me, Trevor, I've I've, I've been listening to you preach now for, for many years, and you've often said to us, we need to ask. He said, this is very difficult for me. But uh, this week, I received a very, very um, scary diagnosis of a very aggressive form of cancer. I'm a doctor. I know how aggressive this is. I'll be starting treatment soon. But I would really appreciate it if you would come around uh, and anoint me and pray for healing. And I realized as I was speaking to him that he was doing something that wasn't easy. Uh, He spent his life helping other people. And it's very hard when you spend your life helping other people to actually acknowledge that sometimes I need ministry myself. And I remember going around, and I went around, I think, for about six or seven weeks 
uh, as he underwent treatment once a week, praying for him for about 15 minutes a week, uh, just laying hands of, on him, anointing him, and being with him. Uh, he's still alive today. It's, uh, he's a great witness to, to God's healing love in his own life. So that's the first step. Are you willing to, to ask? To ask. That's often the beginning. In so many respects, sometimes mothers and fathers and grandparents phone me and they say, would you mind spending some time with my, you know, with my 20-year-old son or my 20-year-old daughter? And I usually say, why don't you just let them make contact with me themselves? I want them to ask. I want them to take the initiative. Very, very important, and you can see how important that is uh, in that instruction. But the second thing is that we open ourselves up, and I'm going to show you this now. Um, Let's just go back to the previous verse. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them, to pray over them, and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And we'll go to the next verse. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise them up. We enter into God's healing love through the mystery of the prayer of faith. Through the mystery of the prayer of faith. Now, at this moment in my sermon, I can go in one of two directions. Uh, I can either spend the next uh, five or ten minutes just teaching about the prayer of faith, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to rather tell you a story. Um, And in the story, we catch a glimpse of what the prayer of faith looks like. And it's a story that's told by a professor of sociology. He's one of the most passionate preachers I know, a guy by the name of uh, Tony Campola. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But uh, he tells a story, and I, I have his story in front of me, and I'm just going to, I don't often read things in a, in a sermon, but I just want to, I want to tell the story in his own words. He had just been in this country, in fact, and he had gone back to the States, and he said, the next week I was back in the States, and I was preaching at a church in Oregon. On impulse, as I ended the service, I said to the congregation that if anyone wanted to stay behind for healing, I would be very glad to pray for them. I told them that I wasn't much good at this because often nothing happens when I pray. But if they wanted to give it a try, I'd be willing to to pray with as much faith as I had. Notice the honesty. Just no pretense, just the humanity of this encounter. Surprisingly, surprisingly, about 30 people stayed behind, waited patiently as I prayed for one after the other. Notice how personal that is. Very, very personal. I didn't want to do this healing thing fast. You know, like some of the healers I see on TV. I wanted to talk to each person before I prayed. And I wanted to get a feel of what was on that person's heart. Notice the compassion. I wanted to almost hug each person and connect with them as deeply as I could. And I did that with each of the people that stayed behind. And in each case, I put some olive oil that I had brought along on their heads It took me more than an hour to pray through this little group, but I did it. And what intrigued me most was that most of the people who had come for healing that day had very little wrong with them physically. One man needed healing for an addiction to pornography. Another woman wanted healing for a marriage. Someone else asked for healing for anger, but there were a few who did have some physical diseases. Four days later, I got a telephone call. And a woman at the other end said, Tony, on Sunday, you prayed for my my husband. He had cancer. Now, when I heard the word had, my heart quickened. Had cancer, I asked. The woman answered, well, he died. When she said that, I thought to myself, a lot of good I do. And then the woman said, you don't understand 
When my husband and I walked into that church on Sunday, he was really angry with God. He had cancer, he knew that he was going to die soon, and he hated God for letting it happen. He wanted to see his grandchildren grow up more than anything. At night, he would lie in bed next to me and he would curse God. It was horrible. And the angrier that he got towards God, the meaner he got towards me. It was unbearable to be in the same room with him. His nastiness just kept getting worse and worse and worse. But when you laid hands on him on Sunday morning and you prayed for him, he walked out of that church a different person. He was different. I could feel it. The last four days of our lives have been the best four days that we've ever had in our marriage. We talked, we laughed, and we loved. We even sang hymns with each other. It was a good, good time. And then she paused and she added something really profound. She said, Tony, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. But he was healed. Do you catch a glimpse there of a prayer of faith? A prayer of faith just happens between people. It's personal, it's real. A prayer of faith is when we are with someone who's not well and we've got one foot in their world of heartache and heartbreak and sickness and suffering and we've got our other foot in the world of healing and hope and God's presence and we're seeking to bring together, we're seeking to bring together those two worlds. The prayer of faith isn't having faith in the power of faith. The prayer of faith is having faith in the nearness and the presence of God. I don't have to crank it up. I simply have a simple trust that God loves this person, knows this person, and wants to love this person into deeper wholeness in this moment. And we never, we never know what God's going to do. Never. Never. Never know. I never know when I pray with someone how God's healing love is going to enter this person's life. All I know is that healing is far bigger than cure. I know that. I know that. And so today I want to invite some of you, maybe you've never done this, I want to invite some of you into the mystery, the deep mystery of prayer, of prayer. And that's the second thing. And the last thing that I want to say to you, let's go back to the text. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Do you see the importance of confession? So often confession and forgiveness and healing go together, go together so often. It's almost as if confession has uh, confession kind of opens the door of our lives to, for God's healing love and presence to fill us. That's the power of confession. It opens up the clog channels of our lives. And when we confess our bitterness, and when we confess our unforgiveness, and when we confess our hatred, and when we confess our guilt and our shame and those things that we've carried around for years and our deceptions, when we're able to get that out into the open, it opens our lives up to the power and to the presence of God's healing love. i never forget a few Easter's two, three years ago. I said to our congregation where I used to work, um, in Benoni, I said to them, I'm going to be in the chapel on Wednesday night between half past six and half past seven. And if there's anyone here who wants to make confession, I'll be there. And I will share that moment with you. And we will kneel before the cross and you can pour out what you need to pour. And I'll, I'll just let me pray for you and 
speaking to your life God's forgiveness and God's mercy. I'll be there between half past six, half past seven. I'll never forget that by quarter to 12 that night, I was still there. That over 45, 50 people, people that I had known for years, known for years, but I'd never known what they were carrying, lined up outside that chapel. And one by one, they would come in and I would spend time with each person. And I will never forget the deep time of healing that was for men and for women. I think that's why those of you who do the 12-step program, how many, I don't know, you don't have to put up your hands, but those of you in recovery, those steps four and five are so important, aren't they? When we make a moral inventory of our life and then we confess to ourselves, one other person and to God, um, how we have hurt ourselves and how we've hurt others. And so often it's that act of confession that opens the door to God's healing and God's presence in our lives. I've seen it again and again and again. I have someone that I see once a month and I often use that time once a month to keep my confession up to date. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to keep the channels open uh, between myself and God. And so once a month, I'll, I'll very informally, I will share the muck and the mess of my life uh, with this person. And this person can be my minister uh, of God's grace and God's mercy. I don't know if this has been helpful. God wants to love us into wholeness. The God that we worship is a God whose healing love constantly flows into this world. Constantly. We need to open ourselves up to it. <laughs> and we do that when we, when we become vulnerable. We do that when we enter into the mystery of prayer. And we do that when we are willing sometimes to make confession. It opens our lives up to healing. Let me end uh, very quickly, just with three, three quick invitations. My first invitation to you as a congregation this morning, can we give a shout out now, today, right now, to all those in this congregation who are in the healing professions during the week. And I'm going to invite you to stand. If you're a doctor or a nurse, a psychologist, psychiatrist, radiologist, dentist, uh, work for the emergency services, uh, do physio, uh, can I just invite you to stand wherever you're seated, if you don't mind. Just stand so we can just say thank, to, thank you to God uh, for you today. We really do want to say thank you uh, to each of you. And we really pray that through this week, your lives uh, will, and your skill and your competency will continue to be a channel of God's healing in the lives of broken people. So that's my first invitation. My second invitation is to every one of you. 1978, I prayed a prayer and I still pray it. Lord, will you make my life a channel of your healing grace and love? Can I ask every one of you to start praying that? God wants to use us to be channels of his healing love. And we need, how to, we need to learn how to do it. I'm still learning how to do it. I'm still learning how to listen and to pray and to be with people in their pain and their hurt and their heartache. The woman I married to, Debbie, she came out of ICU this week. She had a knee replacement, so I brought her home yesterday. Now, I know during this week, I will lay hands on her at least for about five to ten. I love laying hands on Debbie. <laughs> I, will lay hands, uh, I will lay hands on her uh, for about five or ten minutes. Um, I'll just sit with her on the side of the bed, and I'll most probably put my hand, if, if I'm able to, uh, and I won't, I won't talk a lot but I will just hold her in God's healing love. I will hold her. 
that God's healing love will operate, will accelerate the healing processes that already are in process because of the skills and the competencies of the medical profession. But I want to join forces. How, how can you do that? Just in your own home, at work, with people, with friends. Can you imagine, can, can you imagine how God's healing love could just be released if all of us said, Lord, sign me up, sign me up? Wouldn't it be wonderful if this congregation was known as a healing congregation? Wouldn't it be wonderful? Uh, you know, if I was saying at the uh, early service, if I was a, a Methodist bishop, uh, I never made it. I, the only vote I got at Synod was the one I gave myself. Uh, I, I, I just could never make it. And, but I think if I was a bishop, I would make it my policy that every Methodist congregation, indeed every Christian congregation, needs to be a congregation of healing where we naturally, naturally become channels of healing uh, to each other. And the last invitation is to, to those of you who are really desperate today, who really long for Christ's healing touch in your life today. The Christian healing ministry, let me say this very carefully. The Christian healing ministry is Jesus Christ meeting us at our point of deepest need. The Christian healing ministry is Jesus Christ meeting us at our deepest point of need. I don't know where you are most broken today, in spirit, in mind, in body, in relationship. I don't know. But can I invite you today to become vulnerable enough to ask for ministry? And there'll be folk here, and they're not experts. These folk are just recovering sinners just like you. And they will just anoint you and pray for you. But come, come with an expectancy that God's healing love will flow into your life today in a way that it has never done before. That's my invitation to you. And so, friends, in the name of Jesus Christ today, in his name, I want to bless you. And I want to bless each one of you with a very deep experience of God's healing love. I want to bless your spirits today that they may come alive to God again, particularly if your spirits are spiritually dead. May God bless your spirits with a new aliveness. May God bless your mind today, especially if it's in the grip of darkness. May God's light shine into your mind and may you know a new freedom in your thinking. May God bless your body and may there be new sources of energy and strength and renewal and vitality. May God bless your relationships that there may come where there is weariness and tiredness and heartache. May there be glimmers of new life and new beginnings. May God bless you, friends, today with God's healing love in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.